It's June 15th, 1907, and another remarkable event is about to be uncovered by Aria, Rebecca, and Ali, the Retrospectors. Imagine you're a wealthy New Yorker at the turn of the 20th century. You have a vacancy for a cook. Ooh, here's a promising young candidate, Irish immigrant Mary Mallon. Her signature dish, peach ice cream. Yum. But here's what you won't find in her reference papers. Over the past seven years, she's cooked for seven different families, and in every single one, people fell sick or died. And then on this day, in 1907, (laughs) she was outed in a medical journal as an asymptomatic carrier of typhoid. And she was the first ever identified asymptomatic carrier of typhoid. And this is one of the reasons that she actually ended up accruing quite a lot of defenders in the early part of her public life. Just a quick thing on typhoid fever. Bacterial infectious disease uh, presents with fever, headache, stomach pain, diarrhea, and it's spread by contact with an infected person's feces. In a lot of cases, that's due to poor sanitation, so contaminated drinking water. However, you can also get it from eating food prepared by someone who hasn't washed their hands. Mm. And at that time, without regulated sanitation practices in place, the disease was particularly common in New York, and the city had actually battled multiple outbreaks. Uh, So that year, for example, 3,000 New Yorkers had been infected with salmonella and probably Mary was the main reason for this outbreak for reasons that we'll get into. Yeah, I mean, when you say there was a spike in New York, generally it was in places like Hell's Kitchen, you'd find it in the slums. And so the upper classes were able to distance themselves from something as ugly as typhoid and say, well, that's a disease that affects poor people because they're not very clean. But then suddenly you had this wealthy banker, uh, Charles Warren, who in his holiday home in Oyster Bay had all of his family come down with this disease of poverty and Mm. it was he who was the first of the families that the uh, cook Mary Mallon worked for to say I want to get to the bottom of this and find out what is causing my family to have typhoid Yeah, so he hired this sanitation engineer called George Soper to investigate, and he had already investigated several other outbreaks. And Soper quickly suspected Mallon, who had actually left pretty quickly after the outbreak. And this had happened in every single home she'd worked in. As he looked more into her employment history, he realised that every time she took on a new job quite quickly, there was an outbreak of typhoid fever, and then she would leave the job. But actually, it didn't raise any alarm. Nobody knew there was such a thing as an asymptomatic infectious disease carrier. None had Mm. ever been identified. And Mm. because she had never shown any signs of illness, why would she be suspected? And also because domestic work was incredibly high churn. You know, if you read the diaries of wealthy people of the time, one of their number one complaints is that they can't retain their domestic staff. So to have a cook come to your house, work for a few months and leave wasn't an uncommon occurrence. But in the first instance, Soper thought that it was actually these soft clams that the guests had eaten that was responsible. But in looking into it further, not all of them had partaken. So it was at this point that he was like, wait a second, it's probably going to be a person rather than a dish. And so he started looking through the staff role of these particular employers. And then he looked through the roster of wealthy New Yorkers who'd employed anyone on this list. And he found that Mallon kept showing up in summer homes between 1900 and 1907 and there was this trail of 22 infected people and this is where Mallon's dish of fresh peach ice cream which she always served on a Sunday comes into it and compared with her other hot cooked meals he deduced that no better way could be found for a cook to cleanse her hands of microbes and infect a family so it really was this woman it was this dish and so he went to confront her yeah although I wonder whether he really did think it was the shellfish or whether, you know, the life of a freelance sanitary engineer is such. You're on the clock. And you're like, yes, I'm going to spend a few days on Oyster Bay just trying the various different local delicacies to check one of them have typhoid <laughs> before I start interviewing the kitchen staff, if that's okay. Yes, yes, absolutely, George, whatever you need. <laughs> and, but when he finally had all his evidence, he decided to go and confront Mallon. And he caught up with her. She was now working for the Bowen family on Park Avenue of all places. And there was another home, which coincidentally, you know, after the Sunday peach ice cream, Monday typhoid fever. Uh, so he walked into the kitchen and introduced himself and it did not go well as recounted by Soper himself he says 
I was as diplomatic as possible, but I had to say I suspected her of making people sick and that I wanted specimens of her urine, feces and blood. It did not take Mary long to react to the suggestion. She seized a carving fork and advanced in my direction. I passed rapidly down the long, narrow hall through the iron gate to the sidewalk. I felt rather lucky to escape. <laughs> Could she genuinely, even though she'd had this experience where everywhere she went there was a trail of death and typhoid, she genuinely didn't understand what it would mean to be an asymptomatic carrier of a disease and probably just took his insinuation as xenophobic. Plus also if someone came into my workplace and said, hi, I'd like some of your urine, (laughs) feces and blood, I'd probably (laughs) say bugger off as well. (laughs) And so in the end, she had to be forcibly detained by the New York Health Department, led by the pioneering public health doctor Sarah Josephine Baker. First, she tried to fend off the agents, again with her trademark carving fork. When she failed in her attempt to fend them off, they came back with five police officers and she hid in a closet. That's where she was discovered and pulled out. And so Dr. Sarah Josephine Baker recalled the policeman lifted her into the ambulance and I literally sat on her all the way to the hospital. It was like being in a cage with an angry lion. (laughs) (laughs) And where she got sent to was North Brother Island, a facility that had been built to house victims of smallpox initially and then subsequently was used to quarantine anyone with a transmissible disease, but not normally for as long as uh, Mary Mallon ended up living there. She was held in solitary confinement. She was understandably livid. I have Mm. never had typhoid in all my life and have always been healthy, she wrote. Why should I be banished like a leper? Plus also the treatments that she was given sound pretty brutal as well. She was given laxatives and brewer's yeast. The laxatives, I suppose, to get more samples and it kept showing up with salmonella. And then ultimately they said that the only treatment that was going to work for her was to remove her gallbladder and she just hands down refused. Yeah, and you you can totally see how she would have thought that she was being persecuted justly, right? You know, someone comes up to you and tells you you're the world's first identified asymptomatic carrier of infectious disease. That doesn't sound plausible. You know, it's much easier to believe that you're being persecuted because you're foreign, because you're assumed to be unclean. And especially, again, all these haphazard treatments that they tried out on her would only further cement the idea that they didn't really know what they were doing Mm. and that they'd made some kind of horrible mistake and that she was perfectly well and healthy. I mean, she did petition for her freedom, which was denied. And then in 1910, she was finally allowed to leave the island on the condition that she never again worked in any job which involved handling food. And even though she wasn't allowed to be a chef, guess what she showed up doing? (laughs) I mean, some of this is bad and some of it's unforgivable. So what's bad is that she went back to being a cook, preparing food for a hotel, for a restaurant on Broadway, for a spa, for a boarding house. That's all bad and she shouldn't have done it. And she'd said that she wouldn't do it. But she was a trained cook and that's what she knew how to do. And you can see that maybe through desperation. But then she took a job in a maternity hospital kitchen. I mean, yeah. (laughs) <laughs> That's the unforgivable one. And this was also what brought her back into contact with George Soper, who had been hired to investigate this outbreak. I mean, he quickly developed a bit of a hunch about what <laughs> might be behind this. You know, this was a few years later, this was 1915, so she'd been off the radar for a few years. He investigated, he asked around, he discovered that a woman matching Mary's description had previously worked there during the time of the outbreak using the pseudonym Mrs. Mary Brown. And here's a weird tidbit. Other staff at the hospital had apparently nicknamed her Typhoid Mary. It's not clear whether that was due to her showing poor hygiene or just the fact that she was Irish and called yeah. Mary, but it must have been really, really bizarre. But also, I have to say that although she, her whole life she didn't believe that she was a carrier of typhoid, so she didn't think she was doing anything wrong, she did admit in interrogation that she didn't wash her hands while she was preparing food. So the least she could have done, even if she thought that she wasn't a typhoid carrier, was agree to just start washing her hands, but she told them that she just didn't do it and those maternity patients just love peach ice cream on a sunday i mean i'm sorry who's to argue with the facts <laughs> to be fair the infant mortality rate was pretty high like this was probably the best place she could have hidden to be fair yeah, but could she, have been she, anything <laughs> once again you know her signature calling card she had already left at this point do you think date. at this point she sees him coming down the path she just basically gets herself to north brother island <laughs> <laughs> i'll save you the time Where she did end up for, I mean, this is tragic, 23 years till the end of her Mm. life on North Brother Island. And obviously no public sympathy the second time round. I mean, (laughs) you know, to kill seven families worth of children could be seen as unfortunate. But uh, (laughs) a repeat offender who'd promised not to go back into the kitchens doing it again was... uh, 
<laughs> not a great <laughs> garden republic. Not quite on. Goodwill. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> all in all, 51 cases of typhoid and three deaths were directly tied to her. It was obviously impossible to say how many more deaths were caused indirectly from all the spreading. I mean, in fairness to her... <laughs> There is a sort of class bias in the way this was reported and received, I think. We now know that she couldn't have been the only asymptomatic typhoid carrier in New York where there were multiple typhoid epidemics. It's just that she was the working class one that was in the kitchens that then got written about on this day. And you do wonder, like, if the source had been an aristocrat who'd been throwing parties, whether it would have been the same sequence of events that followed. Mind you, (laughs) if you're the only asymptomatic chef refusing to wash her hands working in maternity (laughs) wards (laughs) (laughs) you know that's not the best tomorrow there was also a ban in some cities on displaying carrots without their green tops on show (laughs) love the show support the show patreon.com slash retrospectors part of the acast creator network